So I'm going to move on now to our next speaker. Um, and very excited to um, introduce Darren McGarvey, who many of you will, of course, know. And Darren is a, a broadcaster and a rapper and Orwell Prize winning author of the hugely influential book um, Poverty Safari, which I would highly recommend if you've not yet had a chance to read it. I certainly find it pretty life changing as a GP working in a deep end practice. And Darren talks about the importance of including people and communities in discussions like Stuart has just alluded to in terms of holistic care and holistic research needs a holistic approach. And if we want to talk about poverty, then we need to listen to people who live it. And this very much echoes um, Julian Tudor Hart's description of his experience in the Welsh Valleys when he describes his interactions uh, with the communities he cared for over many years uh, as being initially face to face and then eventually um, side by side, which is a very kind of powerful image. Um, so this community voice needs to be heard when it comes to consulting with communities and those with lived experience when we write policy or when we de design services. Otherwise, we end up propagating the inverse care law where we've got services designed by healthy, usually affluent people, optimally designed for use by healthy, often affluent people. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Darren. Thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you, Darren. <coughs> Thank you very much, Carrie. I'd thank you everyone uh, who has taken part in the event, uh, either as a delegate or uh, as a panelist. Um, I am aware that we are running a little uh, late. My talk today is on the theme of social connection, and uh, I don't have any slides. Uh, I'm not formally qualified in anything, so you can take everything I say with a pinch of salt. Um, but these are observations based on. Uh, living, working, uh, and observing uh, many of the communities that are uh, most acutely impacted by the inverse care law and all of the other inequalities that uh, that, that 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 is related to. <clears throat> this is also uh, I'm reading from the manuscript of my second book, so um, it may be a bit rough in patches. I'm hoping that it won't seem as rough to you as it does to me. Um, but it should uh, it, it should hopefully encapsulate some of the themes uh, that have been discussed so far without direct reference to the inverse care law. Okay. It's a gloomy Sunday. I'm on the edge of a beach, gently rocking a pram containing my sleeping baby girl, looking on as my son builds a sandcastle with his mother. Children are playing. All is well in the world. About 20 feet to my left, climbers scale a rock face, aided by professional equipment. The air is cool but pleasant, but we are not really at the beach, nor are we standing by a rock face. We are stood in a shopping mall, which is doing its best to simulate for us the experience of being outside. Nothing here is real. The sand is synthetic, the light unnatural. The air is conditioned. On the concourse, statues of fawns and small birds. In the car park, plastic flowers hang from artificial trees. The potted plants are fake. This environment has been carefully curated to create the illusion of nature, and once glimpsed, it becomes hard to unsee its falseness. Even the overbearing police presence is cardboard. So much of what constitutes human experience today is entirely simulated. We increasingly derive our sense of community from gadgets and contraptions which act as substitutes for genuine human contact. We give ourselves completely to digital applications which interact with us to in imitate the properties found in human relationships. At night, we soothe ourselves and our children to sleep with the artificial sounds of nearby conversation or running water. We consume dietary supplements which replace the essential nutrients which come naturally from sunlight and energy products which promote alertness in the absence of adequate rest. There is clearly a great desire to connect with nature, each other and ourselves, but increasingly this demand, which is central to our well-being, is supplied by synthetic produce or facilitated by technology. This also extends to human relationships that once occurred naturally as a matter of practicality in many communities. The adage that it takes a village to raise a child is rooted in the understanding that we function optimally in close-knit communities where we feel supported, integrated and useful. Today, society is awash with mentors, life coaches, counsellors, self-help gurus and influencers to whom we turn in moments of doubt, pain or crisis. Yet with more means to connect with others than ever before, 
Why do so many still feel so alone? Why do so many people still feel unsafe, insecure and unfulfilled? And why do we see an explosion in mental health and physical problems which at their root may arise from social isolation? There is no substitute for human touch, a warm embrace, firm eye contact or a calm reassuring voice. Each produce the essential hormonal cocktails which allow us to attach to others and our environments, become motivated and experience gratitude. It follows that the demand for synthetic and technological imitations arises because the authentic alternatives on which they are modelled are in shorter supply than at any time in our history. And in the absence of the essential ingredients necessary for, for the production of wellness, community cohesion, purpose and meaning, we reach out for whatever we can get our hands on to quiet the nagging feeling that we are in some way incomplete, oblivious to the tragic reality that the comforts to which we often turn for a momentary reprieve are often the cause of our deep unfulfillments. There is a way out of the simulacrum and into a realer existence, but not everyone can afford the admission price. The less money you have, the less able you are to purchase your way out of the sensory obstacle course, and the more likely your social connections become frayed as a result. Social connection is everything in life. Many of the instincts, cognitive capacities and emotional responses which ensure our survival early in life are activated by the interactions we have with other people, emerging from attachments we form and beliefs we develop about the world around us. Think of the skin to skin contact between a mother and her baby, the sense of security elicited in the child by her loving embrace. Even before birth, we listen from the womb for signs that we are safe, secure and loved. As we grow, we develop additional attachments beyond our immediate caregivers, mimicking the speech and body language of our peers in nursery school, adopting new interests, attitudes and behaviours which cannot be accounted for by how we are parented. Our sense of independence develops, bringing us into conflicts which depending on how they are resolved, leads to the formation of strategies and values which subtly shape who we will become. Social connections lend vital context to our experiences, as well as promoting the development of empathy and a growing repertoire of dynamic social skills. Relationships are educational and instructive. Every brush with another human being, no matter how inconsequential, can teach us something useful about ourselves, others around us and the environments in which we cohabit. Our lives are improved immeasurably by merely interacting with one another. A trip to the gym is often time to unwind mentally, but our physical performance and mental endurance is often improved by training with others. We may nip out for a walk hoping to declutter our minds, but find that a stranger smile or kindly holding a door for someone is what places us on a sure or mental and emotional footing. Someone referring to you by name or remembering something from a previous interaction can elicit a sense of emotional satisfaction, which is extremely palpable, but also very difficult to describe. Words of encouragement help us work harder. The local barista remembering how you take your coffee breeds a comforting sense of familiarity. A local cafe owner throwing on an extra portion at no uh, charge because you are visibly tired may energise and inspire you. Every interaction lays the foundation of a natural rapport and trust from which a wider sense of safety, security and wellness can emerge. But this takes time. The connections we form with other people, whether primary or secondary, are fundamental to our individual success. But more importantly, every connection we have becomes part of a complex overlay of natural and artificial social networks, which will determine in a general way the aesthetic, social, cultural and economic outcomes associated with our communities. I think of the sleepy little hamlets I have visited while promoting my first book. Places like Burnham and Perthshire are famed for a tree so old it was allegedly written about by William Shakespeare. Beautiful tight-knit towns where the community's central focus was not food banks, but on set setting up an annual book festival, something no self-respecting town can do without, apparently. I recall the bright red solitary phone box in the corner across the road from the art centre, a thing of beauty, wrapped from top to bottom in white twinkling fairy lights. The hotel doors that were never locked, the front door upon which handwritten instructions on how to enter the premises in the absence of staff was prominently attached. The single off licence in one or two pubs, the locals, many of whom were on first name terms with each other. And I recall the dilemma of being unable to locate a bin to discard my cigarette butt, but due to immaculate conditions of the pavement, 
The thought of tossing it in the street filled me with acute panic and dread of judgment. In stark contrast, the exterior of the Saracen Head pub in Porto is covered in fagged outs and the bin in which they should have been discarded was torn from the wall. The local community centre was a relic from the 80s bearing more of a resemblance to an abandoned factory or a decrepit prison than a welcoming public space. Posso had no central preoccupation. The community was fragmented and aesthetically characterised by a visible asymmetric disrepair and dereliction. Are people in Burnham just better than people in Posso, or is something deeper going on? In post-industrial communities of the sort often discussed in terms of poverty and deprivation, social connections are under increasing strain. Emotional stress, economic uncertainty and social insecurity constrains the human ability to form and nurture the social connections so vital to individual prosperity and social cohesion. Then there are the coping strategies to which many uh, turn when they become socially disconnected. The bad habits and lifestyle choices when our well-being is compromised. While providing short-term relief, these coping strategies often become self-insistent, rendering us further isolated in a problem. Parents withdraw from children under the duress of sleep deprivation. Children withdraw from school when they feel inadequate or threatened. Addicts withdraw from society, retreating to the margins. In every case, life's adversities require support to traverse. Invariably, the support comes from other people based on the social connections that are available to us. In communities where social problems are rife, it follows that social connection is all the more important. When elderly people reminisce about the good old days, they aren't being nostalgic about having more money. Materially, they had less. What they are lamenting is the sense of belonging that social connectedness brought to their lives. So connected did they feel that they were comfortable leaving their front doors unlocked or their children with neighbours. Post-industrialisation is often framed in terms of employment. Traditional industries were wound down, creating mass job losses and economic displacement, which contributed to social problems like crime and drug addiction. The malaise that gripped many traditionally working class areas in the 80s was one of a spiritual nature. Idleness and lack of purpose compounded by economic and cultural anxieties created feelings of emotional discomfort from which many sought a destructive escape. Prior to the period of deindustrialization were phases of re re regeneration which created their, their own problems. Again, we tend to focus on the issues of housing and public space. High-rise housing became synonymous with crime and drugs, while physical spaces in which communities could congregate, socialise and relate dwindled because town planners placed little value on them. But little is made of the abrupt and deliberate dispersal of individuals and families who had once lived side by side as cornerstones of their respective communities and neighbourhoods. Those characters, not the physical structures in which they lived, gave the community its distinctive shape. The key aspect conspicuously absent from the mainstream post-industrial mythos, illustrated so often by the iconography of demolitions and mine and shipyard closures, is perhaps the most pivotal, the needlessly violent severing of vital social connections forged over decades of ceaseless social, economic and political change that once bound thousands of individuals, families and communities together in tight-knit, resilient groups. Connections laid down over generations that gave individuals and families a sense of belonging, of shared history in which to orientate themselves and guide others. How does a person become socially mobile when their neighbours and environments are constantly changing? And what impact does this individual's social dislocation have on the cohesion of the wider community? Social connections are the mechanisms by which people foster resilience, pass down wisdom and gather useful information. The wide misconception that the individual is the bulwark of society is undermined by the science of social connection. We acquire language by listening to other people speak. We learn to compromise by sharing resources with others, and we learn how to love by being loved. Where social connections are frayed or severed, individuals, families and communities suffer because the opportunities for more nurturing forms of behaviour to be modelled and adopted are reduced. This does not mean we do not connect or attach. It means we connect and attach to values, behaviours, attitudes and beliefs, which are not always conducive to well-being and, uh, uh, and thus not conducive to social cohesion. In the post-industrial period, as many communities vulnerable to changes in society's economic circumstances have become synonymous with poor educational attainment, 
unemployment, social immobility, ill health and addiction. The demand for social connection is increasingly supplied by the public, private and third sector with mixed results. Social networks are like naturally occurring Wi-Fi that all humans log on to from the moment we are born. Without these networks, we cannot fully develop. Just as Wi-Fi connections can become undependable, social connections and the relationships and behaviours that arise from them can be equally patchy depending on the quality of the network. Individuals, families and entire communities may succeed or fail based on the quality of the connections available to them. One aspect of community life that emerges from the complex networks of social connection is that of an informal social control. Unlike formal social controls, which involve penalties handed down by authorities, informal social controls are enforced by the community. Without positive affirming forms of informal social control, vacuums open into which more formal controls like policing or less savoury informal controls like criminality insert themselves. The don't grasp mantra found in many deprived communities is a form of informal social control, one that is dictated by a pathological distrust of authority, which is not always groundless. But there exist many other forms. The expectation that one must respect their elders comes with no formal punishment, but remains uh, an expectation most people feel. Think of social connections, networks and the informal social controls which arise from them as entities which can be positively or negatively charged. In one community, the expectation is that rubbish must be binned, while in the other, the sense that binning rubbish is pointless because the community is run down, prevails. In one community, people don't think twice about calling the police, while in the other, just the sight of a police car can plunge some into anxiety. Social connection, networks, and informal social controls are central to a community's capacity to cohere and prosper. They are central to how the community looks and feels, but also central to the community's capacity to fight back in the face of the wider economic injustices which render them deprived. Social networks become toxified by emergent properties which are often attributed to individual choices, but which are symptoms of frayed or severed social connection. Gang violence, obesity, morbid, multi-morbidity, distrust of authority, fatalistic attitudes to health, education and social mobility, and the overarching belief that nothing will ever change are symptomatic of social injury. It is when you contrast these properties with the relative strength and resilience of more positively charged social networks, characterised by higher levels of trust in others and authority, better educational outcomes, increased levels of resilience and self and community responsibility, that the multifaceted advantages of affluence, often attributed by the affluent to their own individual choices and capacities, are in fact a byproduct of how well connected and networked they are. The relative individual, household and community wealth across health, education, employment and life expectancy are merely expressions of this deeper social advantage. Uh, and I think I'll just leave it there, if that's okay. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you found that in some way useful.